Welcome to Trillions. I'm Joel Weber. And I'm Eric Balchunas. It's a new year, Eric. Uh, there's going to be some things that will happen this year, no doubt. And I'm wondering what ETFs we should share with our listeners to help them get ahead in the year ahead. Yeah, this has become an annual tradition. We at Bloomberg Intelligence are tasked with writing outlooks, just like all of our stock and bond colleagues. But we also, in addition to that, do a listicle. People like listicles, Joel. They do. You, you Num- know this. Num- numbers. Years, numbers, They yes. tend to go, to, go yeah. well together. So we thought we would do, this is about five years ago. I think we started in, what, 18 or 19. We did 19 ETFs for 2019. We did 20 ETFs for 2020. And today, we're going to unveil 24 ETFs for 2024. See how that works? 24 We for go by 24. the year. Yeah. yeah. Are we, do we actually have 24? Um, so in our big note, we have 24 yeah. because we have Rebecca and Henry uh, contributing from Europe and Asia. But today, we're just going to give you the US version. So it's 15 of the okay. 24. So 24 today. minus nine for the year ahead. So 15 ETFs to know about. Next but the year. US ones, which I think our audience is probably yeah. more interested in anyway. So okay. plus, some of these are going to cause a little debate. Okay. And we just won't have time to get through okay. 24. So, so joining us, James Safer and Athanasios Serafagos, both ETF analysts with Bloomberg Intelligence. This time on Trillions, ETFs for the year ahead. Okay, Eric, you're going to kick it off. You have a disclaimer, and then you're going to give us the first ETF to watch. Yeah, so just real quick, you know, these these are not our picks for what will go up or down. We don't know. We don't make calls. We don't make calls. We're not allowed to. And frankly, I think most people on the team admit none of us know the future. In fact, nobody knows the future, if we're going to be really honest. But these are ETFs that catch our attention, that we're thinking about, that have uh, tapped into some trend or some rarity that just, you know, gets us as if we're ETF scientists. This is something we obsess over a little bit. ETFs to watch. That's what That's right. To it. watch. Yeah. Okay. My first one is the um, Pacer US Small Cap Cash Cows 100 ETF. What's that ticker? CAF. Ooh. So this is the baby brother of cows, which is the large cap cash cow ETF. This ETF made what we do is called an outliers list we do every month, which shows ETFs that took in way more that month in flows than their, than their average, their 12-month average. So mm. if it's more than two standard deviations above it, we, we, we note it because, hey, this is an ETF. Something's happening. Something's happening. CAF has made the list three times this year. Huh. It is really breaking out. If you look at the flow chart, it looks a lot like ARC back in 2020 when it was just coming to be. It's a probably the best kind of flow chart you can have. It shows total organic growth, total grassroots interest, a pure phenomenon. And I would call Pacer Indie. So I call this the Indie feel good hit of the year. And what this does is it looks for cash flow yield in small caps. Now, as you know, large caps crushed this past year. Nobody cares about small caps or anything else other than like the Super 7. So this ETF basically doubled the performance of the Russell 2000, which is this benchmark for small caps. So in other words, it picked small caps from within this universe and doubled it. Mm. That is so hard to do. If an active manager did it, we'd be like praising them all day. Not only that, this beat the S&P. So to think about it, a small cap ETF that's picking certain stocks beat the S&P. Shocker, right? That's why the flows are coming in. People are like, holy moly, this thing has something special going on. Part of it is in small caps, there's a lot of junk but looking at cash flow yield is actually a pretty brilliant way to pick out the better quality type of small cap. So it's something got a quality tilt. But listen to these flow numbers, by the way. It's taken in uh, cash flows for 44 months straight. It's taken in flows every week this year but one. And it's on a 100-day inflow streak. These are Vanguard numbers. Only Vanguard and maybe Schwab can, can lay numbers down like this. And if you look at the holders, it's a lot of the big wirehouses, Morgan Stanley, Wells Fargo. It's so hard to get into those places. So this ETF defied the odds. Can it keep it going? You know, if small caps come back, like some analysts are saying, because large caps had their year, this thing could have a a future. It could keep actually going. So, and it could pass cows, which is its big brother, which is rare. I think that's a great pick. Um, I love what you said, you know, small caps didn't have a great year. So, So to beat not having like some of that, you know, large cap exposure one is really like a pretty incredible feat. James, you got the mic. What's your number two? Yeah, so mine is going to be Bitto, um, the ProShares Bitcoin Future Strategy ETF. Um, I talk about Bitcoin every year. I feel like the last, I think the last two years I had GBTC on there. 
Um, but it's finally here. We're probably going to get a spot Bitcoin ETF in early January, as Eric and I uh, predicted a few months back. Um, so, but the question, like, what's going to happen to Bitto? This thing is well over a billion dollars. It's had a couple billion dollars in assets. Uh, it's done very well as Bitcoin has risen. Uh, but there's some concerns like if most people for, are if they want exposure to Bitcoin, they're going to much prefer a spot allocation, something like GPTC or these other ETS that are going to come to market. So the question is, what's going to happen to Bitto? Um, I think eventually it will go to the wayside, but likely, at least initially, it's going to be stick around. But the problem is Bitto, since the beginning of the year, has underperformed spot by over 14 percent because of the roll cost. So essentially when you have a futures ETF and you have to roll, you have to maintain exposure to the underlying asset, in this case, Bitcoin, it's basically selling a futures contract for one month and buying the next month. And if that next month is more expensive, you're losing money every time. And as Bitcoin goes on a bull run, like it has the last couple months, that, that cost goes up for every month because basically the curve goes into contango without getting too into the weeds. But this means that Bitto, like for a long-term allocation, isn't that great of a, uh, uh, strategy essentially not great of a as great of a tool because basically that 14 percent is this is your cost for owning this etf as compared to owning the underlying asset so it'll be interesting to see what happens i think this thing will be used heavily by the market makers at least initially when we get those spot etfs because they can use them to hedge positions while they're creating markets in other areas um, but it will be fascinating to see like what happens with the flows is money going to pour out of bido and into these spot products who knows uh, but it'll be interesting to watch yeah, and uh, it's ironic that Bitto's getting so much of the attention in the sort of buy the rumor action ahead of the spot mm -hmm. approvals. But when spot gets approved, Bitto is going to get ignored, not totally ignored, but people are going to migrate yeah. because any ETF that uses futures, and if there's one that does it physical, people like it physical. So if that's a billion dollars and we're on here next year, where do you guys think that's at? I think Bitto, I mean, I think Bitcoin might you know, after this big run up, maybe let's, let's call Bitcoin flat. Okay. I would say it loses 30% of its assets, 700 million, but then two years we're at 500 million. I think it's down to under 100 million in five years. So it was years, a though. great strategy before the spot vehicle yeah. finally got approved. Yeah. ProShares made a nice little coin on this thing and it, it served the purpose in the market, but yeah. Um, advisors, if generally speaking, if you put uh, derivatives, I mean, futures in an ETF, uh, they're not going to buy it. The gold futures ETF that used to exist closed. Mm. So, you know, that tells you all you need to know. Everybody wants it physical. Athanasios, what's your third? Um, so this one is MDIV, which is the First Trust Multi-Asset Income ETF. The reason I picked this one is like income was a really hot trade this year, right? So like Jeppy, everyone's just looking at, well, which ETFs pay out the most income, the highest yield? So if we're if we diversify stocks, we diversify bonds, why not diversify your income sources? And this is why I like it, because it holds all different income sources. It holds your high yield bonds, REITs, preferreds, dividend stocks, MLPs. So the risk was sometimes just being so attached to one is obviously you're, you're, you're depending on that one income source. So I like this approach of diversifying it. it has a 6% yield, Jeppy's like 86 .6. And it's at the same place where Jeppy is this year. And Jeppy was probably like the hottest trade this year. It's a little bit expensive. It's a first trust product. You know, them being cheap is not really their ML, but it's about 65 basis points. Um, still pretty small ETF, but I like the notion of diversifying your different sources of income. That one is a little bit more boring than the, <laughs> yeah. the first two. What was the ticker? MDiv. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Eric, you're yeah. fourth. I don't know, Let, man. You don't like that one? Let, let's see what your next round is. Like, bring some I'll be right back. I got to go to the year. espresso machine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Bring some Didn't you lead with cash, year. companies that have cash, a lot of cash on hand? All right. You know what? I was going to save this one for later. I got to bring this now. Okay. I'm yep. going to go with the Global X MSCI Argentina ETF. Ooh. Bring, <laughs> this, it, bring in some heat. Yeah. So they just selected this guy who runs around with a chainsaw and he calls himself an anarcho capitalist. And it's fascinating. Every time one of these emerging market com countries goes from like socialism and then swings so far the other way to like capitalism. The ETFs love it. Um, this thing is up 22% in a month since this guy got elected. The volume's up a lot and the emerging markets as a whole is flat. So clearly people like this. Now, I always find it fascinating. Can he pull it off? So there's this excitement that, oh, it's a more business-friendly leader. By the way, his name is Javier Millet. Yes. And... um 
he's a character, and he's got a lot of attention, but uh, it's all words right now. Can well, he conf- And he was elected by saying some stuff and is immediately like pivoted <laughs> yes. in the office. This is the thing. He what he's saying, it, you know, I get it. It's a great message, I guess if it, well, it could be a good message if you live there, but words to action are different, but we'll see if this works. All I know is that when there's any hint of a pro business leader getting elected in one of these single country emerging market ETFs, the ETF goes wild for a while. And we'll see if this you know, India had happened with Moti yeah. back when he was there, uh Brazil and so here we're now in Argentina. So I like to watch these because I always call single country ETFs so sort of like the sports book of geopolitics. Mm. When you see, <laughs> I love that. That sounds fun. You know, fun. people use them to like bet on Athanasios, these situations. Are you taking notes on this? <laughs> so you bring the bring So the fun. I'm watching. I'll be watching this next year. Can it maintain this sort of excitement or will uh, reality set in and it go what down? Was the, what was the ticker for this? ARGT. So easy to remember it. All right, James, we're starting round two. Go. Yeah, so I'm going to go with something that uh, is, is going to upset Eric a little bit here. I actually did this one a few years back, but I but I have to bring it back. I'm going to do uh, the X-Trackers S&P 500 ESG ETF, ESG ETF, S-N-P-E. Um, so this whole thing, the, the strategy is basically don't rock the boat. So its overall goals are to basically give you a very similar risk return profile, to the S&P 500, but also avoid companies that are doing basically things that is, are against ESG practices. Um, so basically what it does is it decides what ESG factors are most critical to different sectors and then kicks out the worst performers in each sector by whatever those metrics are. So it's going to be different metrics for oil and gas companies versus tech companies, right? Um, so right now it has 322 stocks. The th- the reason I'm covering is because one, I've believed for a long time that these, the, I'm not a huge fan of these ESG ETFs that are picking bottom up based on ESG fundamental criteria. I think you miss out on a lot of p- home runs if you do it that way. If you're just picking solely because of some ESG metrics, it makes sense to use ESG as an overall investment decision in my view, but I, I just, I'm just not a fan of the bottoms up picking solely based on ESG characteristics. And what has this led to? So if you look at the index, it's beating the S and P 500 by, th- by by over 35% since the index was created and back tested in 2005 back tested through 2005. And I know what Eric is going to say and what anyone's saying, well, tell me how it's done since it launched. So, since it launched in 2019, it's beating SPY by 11%. It charges a 10 basis point fee. Uh, it's a great story for advisors. It's not huge tracking error to the underlying asset which a lot of advisors don't want to talk about and that 10% fee is pretty cheap. So, like I said, I, I don't like, I'm not a huge fan of these ESG ETFs that exclude high returners. A lot of them suffered heavily because they didn't have exposure to oil and gas as they, as they went on a run the last couple of years. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm picking SNPE just because it's been performing exceptionally well. And it's one of the rare ESG cases that's doing well this year. It's almost a billion dollar fund. Yeah, no, you're right. The performance has been good, and I have to give that up. Um, and it's a good ETF. Um, you know, the problem is if if you're going in and you're you want quote ESG, um, you look at the holdings here. You've got Amazon potentially like worker issues. You've got Tesla that's got a whole host of issues. You've got Chevron all in the top twenty. So I mean, what are we really doing here, James? Why not just buy the the stupid S and P five hundred? Like well, what it. What are we because really be- doing here? It, it, How is this changing the, the world? It's not changing the world. I don't agree with any of those practice those ETFs that are bottoms up. ESG In other words, you you say buy the this because you might it's a outperforming potential. You could care less and about it's, it's no because it's kicking out the absolute worst performers from each sector. So like there are people, there are firms in the sectors of communications or technology or uh, consumer discretionary that have way worse ESG scores than the ones you named. So it's like a, happening, like a filtering so mechanism the, that's actually attempting to like isolate Pepsi and Coca Cola in the twenty ones. top twenty five. Hey, well, you know. um, McDonald's. Walt Don't Disney. hit him too much. This is just, he's just giving you things to watch. I know, I know. All right. Yeah, th- this this Listen, is an actual. I'm trying core, to get something going here, Joel. After tell. MDiv, we gotta yeah. get get some <laughs> yeah. action here. Well, on that note, <laughs> Athanasios, <laughs> we're on number six. I'm terrified now. How are you gonna pick. follow MDiv up? Terrified. <laughs> um, okay, I like this ticker. It's a new ETF. It's Desk, right? So it's the Vanek Office. It's a good, it's stronger start. Okay, I was coming off better on this one. <laughs> it's the Vanek Office and Commercial REIT ETF, right? It's a little bit of a contrarian play because it's you know 
playing on commercial real estate. But it's a very unique ETF. There's really nothing else like it out there. How so? Uh, because it's focusing mostly just on the commercial REITs uh, and office REITs. Uh, you know, you can get this exposure in some of the bigger ETFs, but it won't be as, as pure as this one. And while the ETF is new, if you look at the index of it, it's below where it was even during COVID. And if you remember, like offices were like done during COVID. So it's like, how is this still at that level? I think if with a change in rates, maybe next year, I think it's something to watch. It's very unique. It's small. Um, there's really no other ETF like it. Um, so I like this one as a contrarian play for next year, especially with a push with firms going back to the office mm-hmm. more. Right. We're seeing, you know, we're seeing it everywhere. Uh, I think this one could be something to watch for next year. I like that. That's a little bit of a sleeper. Yeah. I mean, it's very small. It just came out as one million. So, um, but yeah, That's this this could be a proxy for what you're talking about. Yeah. We always sort of debate on the team, like get it back to the office or whatnot. And I think you're right. That's a good proxy. Uh, Fernando is the top holding and a lot of people have used that as a proxy for. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Beginning of round three, Eric. Hey, hey, hey wait, wait. Oh. I want to add something real quick. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you talked about Vernado. I, I I also agree. Like I love this pick from Ethan because commercial real estate has been something that everyone's talking about. I mean, the, your your sis your sister or sibling podcast at, at Odd Lots is talks about this constantly. So if people are looking for an ETF to play this, this looks like a, a good way to do it. And you mentioned Vernado. Fun fact: we're sitting in a uh, Vernado owned building, technically speaking. Mm, so nice, they're nice, definitely uh, nice commercial not you. real estate. Well, yeah, you're remote. you're in Jersey in yeah. your house, <laughs> or, or I don't know, maybe Vernado built your house. <laughs> By the way, the second <laughs> company is called Kilroy. Uh, Can anybody name the 80s song that has the lyric Kilroy? Oh, man. Probably Magnus is my only hope. Yeah, our producer. Magnus. From the booth. Kilroy. What song? Dicks, Mr. Roboto. Oh. oh see? Very good. Anyway. <laughs> All right. Ra- round three, Eric. I love that song when I was a kid. Okay. Round three. Hold on. Round three, Eric. You got the seventh ETF to watch. Yep. And I think I'll do my most boring one just because uh, those last two were really good. Okay. FBND. This is the Fidelity. You like how he's trying to sneak that in? You can't tell me this is more This is more exciting than listen, M- MDiv. <laughs> I'm like, Fidelity Bond? Is that? Is, he's <laughs> going to try and sneak it past us. Listen, okay, listen, let's hear it. Listen, you're, like, you're one step I, from I'm, I'm like one of those old legacy bands that does shows still. <laughs> you do a couple hits early. Your new stuff in the middle, and then you close with the headliners, okay? So this is the new stuff boring, okay? All right, FBND has $6.5 billion. This is a Fidelity bond ETF. This has also made the outliers list multiple months. And I'm looking at this, and it's fascinating. This is um, Fidelity uh, at 36 basis points for an active bond, and it outperforms the ag. So it's doing its job. It's cheap. It's under the 40 basis point mark. And I think this is representative to me of what to, the company to watch next year, which is Fidelity. Hmm. Fidelity has done a couple things. They've converted some ETFs, uh, mutual funds into ETFs. They are gearing up, I think, for what is going to be a massive year. I think they've finally sold upper management that ETFs are the future. And the, the guy working inside there, I think he's going to be able to do some big moves. I see Fidelity cracking the top 10 in terms of issuer size. And I see them doing all kinds of things, conversions. They filed for an ETF share class of their mutual funds. So if they get all this going, look out, you know, because Fidelity is a behemoth. So one of our big themes in the outlook is the many roads to ETF. So Fidelity is a firm that's going to take every road. Mm -hmm. It'll be busy on each road, and each road will have certain reasons. Uh, You don't use conversions all the time or share classes, but Fidelity is going to be very specific in how it approaches ETFs. But essentially, it's going to slowly start to move all of its existing clients over from the mutual fund format to the ETF format. And FBND at $6.5 billion is crazy because remember Bond, the PIMCO, Bill mm-hmm. Gross Fund? That was the biggest bond ETF, biggest active bond ETF for a long time. This is double that size. Hmm. So that's how fast they, you know, we have a phrase, they grow up so fast. This yeah. is a great example of that. Yeah. I'm curious um, when they discover how they will do active ETFs. Fidelity obviously being uh, famous for its active management history. That's the thing. Um, again, if you can be active, have a, a good name, and be below 40 bips, that's a good That's a good place to be. It's when, if this came over at 90, I would not be as optimistic, yeah. but it's cheap. It's made the decision to do that. And we had um, our ETFs in depth event in December, and Brian Lake of JP Morgan, I asked them what they're most excited about, and he said active fixed income is probably the biggest white space still. Hmm. He said there's just, because... That's a space where uh, mutual funds have way more market share versus ETFs than in the equity side. 
So there's early, early innings in the active bond area. That was less boring than I thought. Um, uh, James, how are you going to follow that with your eighth? Yeah, so I'm going to go with something that's uh, definitely more exciting uh, than Fidelity Bond Fund. But I agree. I, I do agree with Eric's pick. Like, I, the, the the actively managed fixed income ETF space is going to be very interesting just overall because I think that's the way you're going to suck assets for the mutual okay, fund we'll side. Okay, we'll come back to it. That said, let's hear it. My pick is the Round Hill Cannabis ETF with ticker WEED, W-E-E-D. One, I just, I love the ticker. You can't not love, the ticker is just so perfect for, for what it's doing. Um, this is relatively new, right? We've had marijuana slash cannabis ETFs for quite a while now. But for the most part, they weren't offering the purest form of exposure until um, basically MJUS from Advisor Shares came out with this idea, basically offering exposure to what is known as multi-state operators. Um, they're marijuana companies that operate across state lines. So they're in this legal gray zone, basically, that doesn't allow an ETF to invest in them. And what Advisor Shares pioneered was using swaps with banks to get those exposures because technically you're not holding the underlying assets. It's look, look, it's just a gray area. But what weed does is it takes it a step further. Those other ETFs still hold a bunch of other stocks that weren't strictly um, MSOs. They were investing in Canadian firms and other international firms. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do this. But MSO is, I mean, weed is just holding um, strictly MSOs, five stocks. That's it. So it's a super concentrated portfolio. And look, these things have done horribly over the last couple of years. It's continually making lower and lower highs, uh, and then sinking again. So I love, I know Eric likes this too, to look at, at ETFs that have been just like pushed down into the, into the bunker here and see what's going to happen. That was some but nice this is obviously play. would be a play in <laughs> This would obviously be a play on like uh, some sort of federal legalization or further states legalizing marijuana going forward. This is this is going to be a key way to do that. Uh, and it's super concentrated portfolio, uh, a portfolio. And the way it gets around it is we've talked about the single stock ETFs on here. They kind of made this loophole by using those swaps and diversifying who who the swap counterparties are to mat meet the diversification requirements. But essentially, all you need to know is that this is really on the cutting edge of like what ETFs can do. And they're offering super concentrated exposure to those multi, multi-state multi operating um, marijuana firms. You have snuck in like so much little like jargon in there, like concentrates and uh, highs. And yeah, it's like, I I, I, you, you weren't even <laughs> trying and yet you like totally, you know, <laughs> did the cannabis industry a solid there. Uh, uh, can, can I ask you, how many times a week do you smell marijuana? In New York City, all the time now. Like once yeah. a day. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, like, it, so, it's, so. You I know, mean, I'm fine like, with it. I'm yeah. fine with it. But it, I, yeah. I'm telling you, five, six years ago, it was once a week. Whatever. Now it's every day. Whatever. I smell it more than cigarettes. Yeah. This is the future. Okay. Uh, Athanasios, <laughs> how are you going to follow that? <laughs> RSPT. This is number nine, last one for round three. RSPT, which is equal weight SP 500 tech. And this is the MAG 7, right? All this year. But remember, like the 400 or so other companies, like they're they're still out there, right? They're still doing stuff. I, I think Equal could have a year next year. It's just a way to detox off the Mag Seven. You don't want to fully give off the exposure, but I think this year showed that you know, sometimes you know it's a problem when a few stocks just lead everything else. I think there could be a little bit of a reversal. So I like Equal Weight. I'm not. I'm not. So you want to diversify, in diversify the rest of and the still companies. stay in tech. Yeah. So you're not fully getting off of it. You're just sort of you know so rejiggering it. RSPT is like the methadone of the cues. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> Thank That's you. I don't know if I, I didn't know if how far you wanted to be. I yeah. said detox, but <laughs> no, I get it. You're still getting something, so you're not completely yeah. going cold turkey. I, mean, listen, I get it. We had a great fifty percent the cues. You know, I know, whoever said that this year is lying to you. No one had that on no their agenda for that. this year. So yeah. we've had a good. I think just, you know, appreciate it. And I think equal well, ways. Well, round three unexpectedly became a uh, recreational uh, drug uh, <laughs> reference galore. Let's see what round four does. Uh, Eric, kick us off. All right. I will stick with the cues because this one's related, which this one is called JEPQ. So this is the little brother of JEPI. And JEPI. Remind, re remind us what JEPI was? Yeah. JEPI is? is the equity premium income fund that JP Morgan put out that became the biggest active ETF hit ever. Bigger than ARK, bigger than PIMCO. It's got $30 billion, and it it's just breaking all the records. It's a covered call strategy, so it invests in the S&P, although it does some fundamental picking. But it's largely a low-vol version of the S&P, and then it writes call options a little bit out of the money. So if you give up your upside, because if the, if the S&P goes up a lot, 
you have to those options will get called and and you won't get that money but you get premium from selling the the options so it has a big yield and the yield can act as a buffer on the downside so we sometimes call this boomer candy mm. boomers love uh, the protection aspect of some of this because they want to be involved in the markets they're willing to give up a lot of upside so Jeppy has done a great job of bringing that but Jep Q to me is like Jeppy but with a little more juice so like it's the Qs and it's covered call so for example year to date this thing re returned 35 percent you still got 10 11 percent yield and the sharp ratio was 2.5 which is pretty high if you compare that to Jeppy um, in terms of those numbers Jeppy was only up 9%, um, 9% yield, and the sharp ratio was 0.5. So Jep Q has kind of come along as the little brother and beat Jeppy on every single metric. And so it's just catching up in flows too. Now, it'll be interesting because if you're like Ethan and you think that the Qs might be a little out of gas, that yield gives you a little buffer. So Jep Q, I think, also acts as a methadonish way to play the Qs. I think that's a good pick. I think this year that was a tough trade, but I think... Looking at it for next year, it could make sense. The way you're talking, it's like you. Um, we haven't had reviews yet. You're f <laughs> <laughs> you can, come on, man. Hit me. I'm ready. <laughs> Turn it up. Yeah. Come on, man. I, I come think, at me. I think it's a. I, I think it's a good pick. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Nothing. J James, let's hear your number eleven. So, so this was. This I guess uh, uh, this wasn't going to be the one I was going to go with, so I'm going out of order here, but it's directly in line. I guess great minds think alike, right? Um, I agree with everything that Ethan and Eric said, but I think I like a different ETF to look at going forward. So one is just uh, it's the arrow reverse cap weighted ETF. Um, so it's similar. The, the way the one that gets the most play is more in line with Ethan's RSPT, but just regular RSP. It's taken in a lot of money early this year and flows are pouring in again late this year. And basically all that one does is it equal weights the, the S&P 500. Whereas YPS, the one I'm picking, actually reverse cap weights it. So basically the smallest ones in the S&P 500 get the highest weight in YSP. And that's because of all the stuff that they all both just talked about with the Magnificent 7, Super 7, whatever you want to talk about it. They're like making up 75% of the returns so far in 2023. But I like YSP to play it, even though it's only a $10 million fund, it's getting no interest from anyone, but everyone's pouring into RSP instead. But in my view, I just think it's a more efficient way to kind of make this play. Rather than selling out of your S&P 500 exposure, you could only sell a small chunk and then buy this thing as a complement to kind of get that sort of similar equal weighted type exposure. You don't need to sell the whole thing and move into another product. So I just think it's efficient from that way. And if you really are betting on the smaller cap stocks catching up to the large cap stocks or outperforming the the larger names in the ET, in the index or ETF in this case every time that there's been a run where equal weight outperforms the regular market cap weighted ETFs in this space YSP has outperformed the equal weighted version so it's basically like a leveraged version of RSP I mean, obviously, past past performance is not indicative of future return, but by reverse cap weighting, it ends up being a more leveraged play on equal cap weighting. And I think you can use this to make a more efficient exposure if you want to dial down your Magnificent 7 or Super 7 exposure. Athanasius, would But no one seems to care. No one's buying this thing. Athanasius, would you trade your pick for that pick? I'd still stick with mine. Oh, zing. It's, it's, a, <laughs> it's a good pick, but I, I, still, like, uh, I still like having um, being still in tech. Okay, so... Yeah. I, I'm not saying to get. I'm not saying to get out of tech. You would just take like a chunk of your S and P 500 exposure and put it in this to kind of lower your exposure to the Magnificent Seven. That's all it would do. I would never say replace your S and P 500 with this thing, but I think it's a good compliment to to kind of get the same thing without having to sell anything. Yeah, fair. It's a, a it's whole a, position. Just a little bit of methadone. He, he's yes. still he's still not sold. <laughs> yeah. um, all right, this is like the most toxic trade ever. I think that you want to love it. It never works. It's value. Right, every year it's like this is it. Like I've changed, uh, you know. And <laughs> I've talked to Chris Kane. He's our quant strategist at Bloomberg Intelligence, and there's a lot of stuff that points the value for for next year. And if you're gonna do it, you're gonna have to go full in. So it's QVAL, it's the Alpha Architect U.S. Quantitative Value ETF, and it's very concentrated. It's got the purest exposure to value. Um, so if it's if you're gonna do it, do with QVAL. I think it can have a pretty interesting year next year. Um, I know we've called value in the past before. Uh, you sometimes get these little bouts of uh, outperformance, but I think <laughs> could this year be different? I don't know, but I think QVAL is something to watch for next year. Yeah, th this um, 
This ETF is in the top five of our factor intensity score for value because it's like hot sauce value. When value comes back, this thing should be at the top of the performers. And I just think that makes sense, you know, because you got a lot of value already in S&P 500 or your total market. This just gives you a little tilt with only a little dose. So you'll need a little bit of this pu puppy to give you some real exposure to value. And there's a junk screen in it. So it's not that hardcore where it buys total junk. Yeah, I mean, the value, I feel like every year I've been hearing the value is going to come back and it has spurts where it comes back. And then as Eric likes to say, the cues and high, high tech, high cap growth just comes and runs it over. So um, yeah, I, we'll, we'll see what happens, but it's it's certainly been, uh, it's been hard to, to stick with value for a long-term long -term play, but I, it's a good pick. You know, the um, on last year I did iVal. iVal is QVal, but worse because it's international value. Mm -hmm. So if you really want to go crazy- Ival, get the the PE on Ival. Anybody want to guess? It's like seven, lower. <laughs> <laughs> Just for context, the PE what? on the S and P five hundred is twenty five ish, twenty six. So what what do you think Ival's pu public? I mean, um, price to earnings average ratio is five, six, six. Okay, I mean that is like yeah. At some wow. point, right? That is like does yeah. that I know. Does that have a well, do you see this chart in the MSCI World? Apple now has a bigger weighting than the UK. Yeah, bigger than France. I mean, the Super 7 make up more than like the rest of the world combined, pretty much. By Super 7, you mean the Magnificent, the Magnificent 7? 7. I like Super 7 because of alliteration. Maybe, yeah. And Magnificent what? Seven's a movie. Maybe it's worthwhile to say what, what the Magnificent 7 is. Maybe it's worthwhile to say okay, what the Magnificent 7 is. So just it, for anyone who Western doesn't know, it's with Lee Apple, Marvin. Microsoft. <laughs> okay, wait, wait, wait. Let's, <laughs> let's actually say it. Okay, James, Magnificent we, 7. Since we've said it like... Yeah. Listen, yeah. by the way, let's say, let's say, let's say they, cr they crash and burn next year. And there's one of those stock we can throw in. We can call them the Hateful Eight. James, let's name the Magnificent Seven just so we have it on tape. Go for it. Yeah, yeah. So it's 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 Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, aka Google, Amazon, uh, Nvidia, Tesla, and Meta, aka Facebook, the artist formerly known as. So those are the seven so names like we that we keep talking Fang. about as though everyone knows. But just to make sure, yeah, we, yeah. we kept adding A's to Fang, and then we were like, wait, we just needed something new. It's, Nvidia and just Nvidia crashed really, the party yeah. in a good way. Yeah. Uh, Tesla too. Yeah. Final round, Eric, you're going to kick us off with number 13. Okay. Number 13. My last pick is Tua, which it's not the quarterback for the Dolphins, although I like him a lot too. It's the Simplify Short-Term Treasury Futures Strategy ETF. I picked this for a few reasons. One, you know, the Fed has seemingly said we're you know not mission accomplished quite but they're clearly feeling good so if they were to start lowering rates next year clearly you'd want to be long treasury so this one is like a leveraged it's actively managed uses treasury futures and it's got some leverage in it so if rates fall this will pop a little bit and futures are a pain to to use a lot of institutions do this trade this is a trade that was popular at pimco for a while so i like this for a few reasons one Next year, again, if you think rates are going to fall, this should be in a good position. Number two, it does a lot of legwork for you. It does something that's a pain in the butt. Three, you only need a little. Again, just a little bit to get you where you want to go in terms of playing uh, the rate fall. And then the other reason is this is Simplify is a fascinating company. They came along and they've got a lot of ex-hedge fund people there. They're the closest thing to an actual real hedge fund in the ETF world. And this is proven by the fact that they have gotten multiple institutional investors to buy into their funds. Like Tua is owned by the Michigan retirees, and then they've gotten General Electric's pension. I can't, as a guy who wrote a book about institutional usage of ETFs, it is so hard to get an institution to buy into an ETF that isn't just like one of the liquid ones they use mm. quickly for some like, you know, short term usage. But for them to invest in your fund, it's rare. They like to be exclusive. They like to go with the best brains they, the ETFs to them are like the public pool that all the plebs use. They're like, I don't, I'm better than that. So the fact that institutions are going in here is a, I think, tells you how serious people take Simplify and mm -hmm. the people who work there. And I think it's fascinating because these ETFs, two is 15 basis points. A hedge fund would charge you two and 20 for this potentially, or at least a lot more. Hmm. So we're talking hedge fund style management for Vanguardian fees with people who are from the hedge fund world. We're finally seeing that kind of experiment in the alternative space, and I'm, I'm here for it. So what's in the portfolio? Treasury futures. So it's actively trading treasury futures. Hmm. 
Yeah, I, I would say that I, I love this pick because I feel like for years, us and pretty much everyone else is like, this might be the year that like alternative ETFs take up like more space. They compete more with hedge funds. We all, Everyone thinks like the alternative ETF space should be larger. It just isn't. Um, there's been some like um, good hits. Managed Future Strategies in 2022 did very well. Some other things like that. But for the most part, there just isn't a massive demand, but it's growing heavily now. And a lot of that is being led by, by Simplify here. Um, so I, I, I love this pick like that. All right, James, what's your last pick going to be? Yeah. So I'm, I'm kind of breaking the rules here, but I think it's for, for, for very good reason. Um, I'll be, I'm I'll be the judge not of that. Picking an ET- <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm picking a mutual fund ticker, mm. uh, SWVXX, which is a mutual fund and not an ETF, so I apologize in advance, but it's a Schwab money market fund. This thing is yielding 5.26%, and I'm probably putting people to sleep right now hearing this, but when I throw these other numbers out there, it'll be interesting to to see if people realize this. This thing charges 34 basis points, which, again, not super expensive, but also definitely not cheap. Like I don't think a lot of people realize that these money market funds make a lot of money for these companies, even though they were basically money losers as people were <laughs> putting money into these things when rates were zero or basically negative. That said, this thing has taken in, at the end of 2022, it had $161 billion dollars. Again, not nothing, very good. It now has $258 billion. That thing has taken in $97 billion in one year. If we had an ETF that did that, it would have been on the front pages of everything. So this, I think, is the the most successful fund in the U.S. in 2023, as far as I could tell. Um, money market funds as a whole are likely to hit a, tr- could hit a trillion dollars in inflows this year. ETFs have never done that. So I feel like we just need to kind of point out what's happening here. And part of the reason SWVXX is at the top of this is for like going back into some wonky things. We always talk about commissions and freeze and everything's free commission now, but that's not the case anymore. So Schwab bought TD Ameritrade. So anyone who's on Schwab or TD Ameritrade, if you want to buy a money market fund, there's a commission to do it. It costs like it's not cheap. But what they've done is they said, you can buy our ETFs with no commission and we'll put you in them. So people, it looks like anyone with a TD Ameritrade or Schwab account is looking for somewhere to put this. This is this is the one they're defaulting to. And this thing, again, is it's going to take in over $100 billion in a year. So, yes, it sounds sleepy, but like it's just mind boggling. That, that is an insane when, amount of money for one about fund. It. Insane. Yeah. I mean, the ETF that's going to take in the most money this year is VU at about $40 billion. Hmm. And ETFs are on fire. And that's yeah. 100. Yeah. It's it's whacked. Uh Eric's going to have some other comments in your review about bringing a mutual fund to an ETF party, but you know we'll we'll, we'll keep it at that. All right, number fifteen, Athanasios. And, um, that also makes MDiv look like Don't Steve disappoint. McQueen, man, like the money market fund. Yeah, true. You know, <laughs> but anyway, it's still a good pick. Um, okay, last one. I always like Steve to, McQueen. <laughs> that's Mr. Cool, right? Yeah. yeah. I, well, is this, are people going mean, to? Are really... your listeners going to get that reference? Or y- not? Y- y- uh, no, we're going to go with it. You're just <laughs> doing it. It's. Uh, a, it, I like the reference, but I mean that's uh, going way back. Yeah. Um, All right, give us the okay. give us the car chasing I always and bullet. Like to Come on, bring it home. Pick one that's like synonymous with closures. Last year I used K-pop, which was like closing. You know, thematics were getting a little out of hand. This one's gonna be crypto. I think A E T H A F, which is the Bitwise Ethereum futures ETF. This has got to go. I think like Jeez. it's eighty five basis points. It's got a million. It offers nothing different than the other ones. Um, I think. It'll go because eventually if a Ethereum spot is approved, it's because you have a better product. But I think crypto's gotten a little chummy and one of them's got it. I, I, I can see this closing at some point this year. Um, so I, I think that's one to one. It might not be that one, but I think one of the Ethereum futures ones are going to close. Yeah, and there's a couple that do Bitcoin plus Ethereum futures. Um, I'd say half the category is probably going to close. I mean, even the ProShares one is only $10 million. Bitwise is less than that. Look, um, I think what we learned from the Ether futures... ETFs launching is that, you know, the mania is over. People aren't going to buy any single coin you put out there. Also, Ether, it's it's Ether and futures. But I don't think this necessarily takes away from a spot Bitcoin ETF. I think that should be a legitimate hit. Um, but this definitely was underwhelming by anybody's standards. Uh, really, these launched and like almost nobody cared. Uh, no, you know, we, we cared because we were covering the launch, but, yeah, but, yeah, but not nobody us. really not cared normal. about we're it. We're not whatsoever. everybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That said, I'm I'm I agree. I love this pick because I I honestly would have picked one of these if Ethan hadn't already called dibs on it because 
Eric and I, I mean, we, we, we haven't put official eyes out there, but I think it's pretty likely that we see a spot Ethereum ETF in 2024. We yep. have we have a couple deadlines coming up on May 23rd and 24th for ARK and Van Eck, a bunch of other filers. I think it's likely that we get a spot Ethereum ETF. And if we do get that, I a Bitwise is probably going to be in that race and launching one of these things. And I can't see them keeping the, the, the Ethereum futures ETF open, particularly if they don't manage to garner any assets. So I'm, I'm with you. I, th I think this is a really good pick for, for a potential closure next year. And I think multiple Multiple, like both of them have said, multiple Ethereum futures ETFs or crypto futures ETFs are, are likely to close too. All right. That rounds out 15 ETFs for 2024. Athanasios, <laughs> James, thanks for Do doing you like math. like the ring of that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> thanks for 15 doing for some, 24. Some good math with us. Yeah, there's for there's nine us. more on the Bloomberg <laughs> terminal <laughs> that you can find in uh, the team. Yeah, if that notes. piqued your interest. Yeah. All right, thanks for having me on. All right. Have a great year, everybody. Thanks for having me on, guys. Thanks for listening to Trillions. Until next time, you can find us on the Bloomberg Terminal, Bloomberg.com, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you like to listen. We'd love to hear from you. We're on Twitter. I'm at Joel Weber Show. He's at Eric Balchunas. This episode of Trillions was produced by Magnus Hendrickson. Bye.